Amen. All right, kids and, and infants or whatever. What is that? The kids? You guys can leave. <laughs> oh. You guys are great. Did you have a good worship experience? It's tough to get into videos, right? But we can worship God anywhere, anytime, anyway. All we have to do is just detach from ourselves and attach to the Holy Spirit. And that's worship. We worship him as we pursue him. So that's kind of today's message, even a little bit about that. We've been on this kick for the last, almost starting with Chris, I believe, so almost three weeks. Lori and then Steve were all talking about kind of wasted time, distractions, um, having too much on our plate to do, right? Have you guys been here for those? It's kind of been the theme for the last couple of weeks. So that's what today's message is about as well, is about how to overcome distractions so we can um, pursue each day with purpose, if you will. And I'll, I'll explain that as we go. Um, I want to read a verse with you, and then we'll kind of get into it. I'm also using the handheld today because chances are the jacket will be coming off within five minutes. And I didn't want my microphone to fall off, so there's that, Nate. <laughs> All right, Luke 1040. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. And then Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. I want you to take note, leave us up for a second, but I want you to take note, we're looking at kind of distractions today. Take note that Martha, I know we've all heard this story, so we're not going to really dissect this story, but we're just setting it as a principle of today. Martha was in the presence of Jesus. She was in his presence, but she was distracted from seeking him. And when we're distracted, we become what? Worried and troubled. Distractions prevent us from pursuing each day with purpose. Distractions stop us from becoming kind of all that God wants us to become. So that's what we're talking about this today. I want you to think for a minute about your distractions, about maybe gas or the economy. And I feel Jesus saying, Martha, you're so worried and troubled. Or maybe um, diseases and sickness, distractions. Martha, you're so worried and troubled. But I got to do this and this. We have to-do lists, right? And I hear Jesus telling us, but Martha, you're so worried and troubled. We think about our bills we have. We think of all these things. And I feel Jesus is telling us today, but Martha, you're so worried and troubled. Martha was worried and troubled because she was distracted from the presence of Jesus. She was focused, if you will, on outcomes. She had, it was a good distraction. We have good and bad distractions, right? Um, and that's what we're talking about today is these distractions, how we can overcome them. But Martha was d distracted on a good thing. But she chose to worry and have trouble about preparing something We had a good outcome, right? And Jesus comes up to her and is like, yeah, but you're not seeking me. You are focused on the outcome of the solution and the problem. You're distracted by that, which is pulling your focus off of seeking me. Another way to say it was Martha was here, but Jesus wanted her over here, right? I think a lot of us have this issue where we are here, but God wants us over there. Does that make sense to you? Um, and then we let, and I'll explain this a little bit more, but we let distractions get in the way of us becoming over here into Jesus' presence, which helps us or prevents us from pursuing each day with purpose. So as I preach today, I want you guys to think of, do you pursue each day with purpose? And I'll explain to you what that means in a minute, but I want you to think for a minute on that, 
and I was going to call on people, but I won't because it's kind of unfair. Um, but what does that mean to you? What does it mean to pursue each day with purpose? So I won't call on you, but, but think on that. What does it mean to pursue each day with purpose for you? So I'll use this as my example. This is a concept, I, I rewrote this message, a completely different message, but I used this concept two weeks ago at a church I was visiting, so I'm going to use it again, just the concept, because I think it paints a beautiful picture. Um, we get distracted, and we're going to talk about those distractions, how to overcome them. So we are all here. We used to be over there, right? We are, we are all here in life, wherever you are with your walk with God. You're, you're here somewhere. But each single one of you, I was going to make a joke except, except Barry in the back. Hey, Barry, how you doing? I saw you walk in late. That's your punishment. Each, <laughs> each one of you has a purpose and a mission that God has planted in you to accomplish for this world. And we're not going to really talk about what that purpose is because we're talking about distractions, but just so you know, and we'll talk about it a little bit towards the end, is it's always for other people. It's not for yourself. It's not a, oh, God wants me over here so I can have this house and cars and blessings. It's, it's over there so we can bless and witness to other people, save other people, tell other people about Jesus. Wherever you are in life, we are all here at this point. We're all somewhere on this walk. But God wants us all over here, until the day we die, we're going to keep progressing. Because he has a call in your life, a purpose, a mission in your life, all everyone's life, no matter your age, you still have breath in your lungs, you have a mission from God to accomplish. But the problem is, so often, this gets in the way of us getting to where God wants us to get. This is our distraction, whatever it is. So often, the stool for Martha was the dinner. Not a bad distraction, but it gets in our way, and Jesus is like, I want you over here, church. My church needs you over here. The body of Christ needs you over here. We need you over here, but there's a distraction. There's something in your way that's preventing you, and it's usually causing us to waste our time and our life and our resources, and it's preventing us from getting to where God wants us to get because other people need us over there. So to me... I want you to think of what the person over there looks like for you. What does God want you to do over there? To me, it is this. The person over there pursues each day with purpose. They read their Bible. They see Jesus daily. They have unrushed, uninterrupted time. They're not afraid to witness to others. They do not get overran by distractions. They're full of peace. They're full of forgiveness, love, compassion. And they overcome their distractions. You're not pursue each day with purpose until you overcome your distractions, whatever they are. So we're going to talk about distractions for a second, what they are. Can anybody, we'll do a little Q&A for a minute, tell me what they think the definition of distraction is. How would you define a distraction? Okay, that's a beautiful answer, Lucinda. Something that takes you away from what you should be doing. Anybody else? A dead end detour? Yep, that's good too. A shift of your focus, beautiful. I will read you the actual dictionary, those are all correct, but I'll read you the actual definition of distractions. The actual definition of distraction is this, a thing to prevent someone from giving their full attention to something else. I'm going to say that one more time. It is a, a distraction is a thing, or whatever, that prevents you from giving your full attention to something else. Do you give your full attention to seeking Jesus? I'm not saying... We go through each day, every second of the day, 
trying to see Jesus, we should, but that's almost impossible. But what I'm talking about for today, it's not impossible, I'll take that back. But what I'm talking about for today is even when you sit down to have Bible time in the morning, when you read your Bible, when you pray, are you pursuing Jesus with 100% of your focus? Or do you allow distractions to get in the way? There's a Harvard study done that said that 50% of the time, I'm setting my alarm just so I don't, because today's a preaching day, I can tell. I don't want to go for six hours. We'll get out at four. Um, <laughs> Harvard study said everyone, 50% of their time, spends their waking moments thinking of something else. Think about that for a minute. That's true but kind of scary that we spend 50% of our waking moments thinking of something else while we're doing something. So our minds wander, right? We get distracted, our minds wander. And that's kind of what this, this um, study shows. So our, in our Martha story, her distraction was preparing dinner. Like I said, a good thing. But she was distracted. She wasn't giving what Jesus 100% of her focus when she was in the presence of Jesus. I want us to look at this as... It is a literal story, but not even as a literal story, just as a, as a metaphor for our lives, is when we are spending time with Jesus, which we should be doing every single day, are you more like Martha, where you're kind of over here thinking of other things, your to-do list, what you're doing, or are you spending 100% of your focus tapping in to the creator of the universe who died for our sins and rose again? Do you give him that kind of attention? Our distractions... Just so I'll list a few, think of your own, I want you to think of your own distractions, can be past pain, need for control, worry, present pain, focus, ambition, love of material things, comfort, sleeping in, fear, money, TV, gossip, work, social media, cell phones. All these things, right, can be our distractions. So I want you guys to think of what is your distraction that pulls most of your attention away from seeking Jesus when you're with Jesus, when you should be spending time with Jesus. Distractions, as I'm going to keep saying over and over again for the remainder of the today so you know, keep us from going from here over to here. A distraction, whatever yours is, your main distraction, we'll have many, but I want you to think of one main distraction because we're going to try to overcome that today, prevents you from... 100% of your focus pursuing Jesus so your life can have purpose and your day can have purpose and you can do what he has sent you here to do each day. So many of us don't live our lives that way because we kind of just consider Jesus in the morning. Maybe throw up a quick prayer, read our Bible a little bit. But it's not that 100% focus on Jesus. We're not seeking him 100% because we allow this stool or whatever this is to get in the way of us be coming over there. So I'm going to wrap up with distractions with this, is I think we are addicted to our distractions. I worked as a drug educator for the state for six years, and I, I um, wrote drug education programs for counselors, for non-for-profits. Um, I did presentations all over the country for counselors, not-for-profits on, on addiction. Um, my specialty was addictions. So we become, I was going to draw it out, I was looking at that, but I'll try to explain it. Um, we become addicted to whatever your distraction is. And, and this is how I'm going to explain it to you, how the brain works with um, chemical addictions, even with gambling, with any addiction, even with cell phones, whatever your addiction could be, whatever's presenting, preventing you from getting to 100% onto focusing Jesus, this is what happens. Your brain has endorphins, right, dopamine. And normally you have your set of dopamines coming out in the day. But what happens is our brains start to wander and we pick up our distraction, whatever it is. I'll just use cell phone because it's in front of me so it's easier. And we pick up our cell phone and then that releases a dopamines in our brain. So our brain will make it nice and easy. Let's say it normally has five endorphins in it. It has a lot more than that, but we'll just say five. You pick up your cell phone, now it has ten. So you got a little reward. That distraction was a reward. You kind of feel happy even though you don't do it. It's, it's a subconscious. You're like, ah. But this is 
true for all addictions. This is what's amazing about just our brain. Now your brain, though, because it just got overdosed with endorphins, if you will, now naturally creates this border around it. Um, I'll call it your pleasure sensor that, that releases the endorphins. Um, I actually know the scientific term, but I'll, I'll pronounce it wrong. And you might, the lawyer might not, might, lawyer might not, I was going to say, you might not know. So I could have pulled it off. But your pleasure center sends out endorphins, and what your brain does, it creates this barrier around where your endorphins are. And now you pick up your cell phone again, boom. This takes over time, obviously. It's not just one time. Whatever your distraction is. And now your endorphins release the 10 again. But your brain has created this wall that doesn't let those extra five in. Does that make sense to you? So you have your normal five. You just pick up your cell phone. Boom. No change. Whatever your distraction is that's preventing you from focusing on Jesus 100%. Boom. Can't get into your brain now. So that pleasure doesn't go off. That's how addictions work. That's how all any kind of behavior modification works. So it creates this barrier. So now, instead of a five-minute scroll, you need something bigger and something longer to break through that wall to create those endorphins. So now your five-minute scroll has turned into a 20-minute scroll. And then you get those endorphins. Then it happens again and again and again. So whatever your distraction is, it releases these endorphins that we get addicted to, and we want to pursue more and more, even if you don't know you're doing it, that's preventing us from getting over here to where Jesus wants us. And we need to um, almost magnify it more and more as time goes on. Does that make sense? So think of whatever your distraction is. You have to keep adding intensity to it just to get those pleasures again, even though you don't know that's what you're doing. That's what your mind's craving. So that's even with drug addicts. We won't get into that, but that's why drug addicts usually have to do more and more and more and more drugs to try to get to where they're at. But that happens for any kind of addiction. So... Let's talk about how we overcome our distractions, how we can overcome this addicted to the distractions. Isaiah 58, 2 says this. This is the verse he gave me, God gave me to overcome distractions. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways. Yet they seek me daily, and they delight to know my ways. So to overcome distractions, we have to seek God daily. And I'm going to talk about what actually seek means. And then it has two parts. The second part is to delight to know his ways. So what are his ways? We're going to talk about that towards the end. The first part is to seek. So let's break down what seek means, because seeking the Lord daily will help us overcome our distractions so we can pursue each day with purpose and get to where he wants us to get to. Seek is mentioned in the Bible 389 times. 389 times. That leaves this big footprint, right, of, of what we're supposed to do, seeking God. The word is bakwash, and it means church, investigation, pursuing, and taking a hold of something. It is a, seeking means, a desire to obtain. I want you to write that down. Seeking is in a desire to obtain. In Hebrew, it actually says this, to pursue God rather than your goals. This is this word more than seeking. It's giving something our full attention. And what do we talk about distractions? They rob us of our full attention attention. Seeking means searching with a purpose. 389 times it's mentioned in the Bible that we're supposed to seek after God. Seeking every day, every morning. Seeking means seeking with a purpose. Jesus is saying, seek me with purpose each and every day. Do you pursue Jesus every day with purpose? Because seeking him will give our life purpose. Seeking Jesus will redirect our thoughts so we can overcome distractions. Redirecting our thoughts is how we overcome distractions. This means we need to 
monitor kind of our thought pattern. And I'm going to explain more what seek means. But to overcome distractions, you monitor your thought pattern. And when you want to indulge in your distraction, good or bad, Martha was making dinner, wasn't bad. When you want to do that, you stop your brain pattern. And then you, in this case, is why Jesus says, seek me 389 times in the Bible. You seek Jesus mentally with that desire. And eventually, what you focus on becomes what you desire, and that will change your thought pattern. You'll redirect your thought pattern. How it works is the more you do it, the more you will desire it. So the more you seek Jesus, even if it's two minutes in the morning, 100% your attention on him, after a while, just like I just talked about addictions to desire, you'll start desiring it more and more and more, and you can build up on that over time. We need to train our mind if we want to change our mind. So I'm going to tell you a story about what distractions are. It's a fun story. It's actually, what? Um, I'm taking off my jacket now. Uh, well, it's hard to, well, when you go to the gym every day and your shoulders are kind of big, right, honey? It's hard to get that off. It's hard to get that off. <laughs> All right, now what distractions are, I'm going to give you a story. I move around, that's why I'm taking off my jacket, especially when I tell a story, of how we're supposed to seek God, okay? The, I want you to think of seeking God every single day with purpose through this story. Last year, about summertime, before I even say that, let me tell you something personal. Don't tell anyone. Um, I hate mice, bats, and anything small, snakes. I... I <laughs> My father-in-law makes fun of me all the time. He's like, there's snakes out back. Why don't you go uh, catch some? I'm like, oh, I'm good. <laughs> I just, I would rather, I tell people this all the time. They think I'm lying. I would rather fight a bear because at least a bear, you can see it coming. <laughs> and you can at least start swinging on it. It's big. <laughs> I saw this meme the other day. It has nothing to do with my sermon, but it was funny. Because I tell, you can ask my wife. I've been saying this since she's known me that I'd rather fight a bear than like wrestle a mouse because it's too fast and quick. Um, but it was this guy that was talking about fighting a bear. And he's like, first I would face it. And then... I would square up with it, then I would swing, and then I'd jump on its back and strangle it, and it goes like 15 things. And then at the bottom it says, realize between step one and two, you're already dead. So, <laughs> nothing to do with a sermon, but I'd rather fight a bear than mess with a mouse or a snake. I just don't like fast, quick things. Um, last year, summertime, about, my wife and I were sitting, reading books, like good Christians do. It's true, actually. We're reading books, dude. Look at that. I didn't even have to make it up. Um, and then out of the corner of my eye, I see this when I'm reading a book. It was, no lie, I'm not going to exaggerate, a 10-foot bat with grapefruit-sized talons, big red glowing eyes. I actually have a picture of it. That wasn't it. <laughs> I, last night, out of nowhere, I woke up at like 11.30. Actually, I wasn't in bed yet, but I ran in to send my slides before. Like, I ended that, and I'm like, why it would be funny? Finding a giant bat and throwing it in my slideshow. So that's what that was. Um, <laughs> so it flies out. Remember, we're talking about how we're supposed to seek after Jesus every single day. Me and my wife get up, and you can ask her. I started picking up everything near me and throwing it at this bat. I picked up a footrest and just hawked it. I'm like, Rah! we had a box fan. I picked up a box fan. I threw that. I think I threw a chair at it. Like, I'm throwing everything. And I'm screaming at it going, ah, throwing everything we have. <laughs> we frantically look for our, our rackets because this is not the first bat that has ventured into our house. One of them, my father-in-law, as I tell the story, this is a little exaggerated too, he caught it like with his bare hands. He's like, because he's a woodsman. Um, that's not the whole story, but that's how I tell all my friends. I'm like, yeah, my father-in-law came up and he's just like, oh, look, a bat. Mm. <laughs> I know you're going to hate the ending of the story. I was, because Kathy's going to be like, oh, you guys killed a bat. So I'm deciding if I'm going to edit it. Um, so it's in my house, flying around. We get our rackets, and then it's gone. Quick, quickly as it came, mysterious as it came, it's gone. We start 
tearing apart the house looking for this thing. Because now it's almost bedtime. It's like 11. And we got to go to bed with this bat in our house. And I'm like, oh, we're going to find it. So we're, we split up. It happened on a Monday. By um, next Friday, we're still, no, we didn't sleep or nothing. We just kept searching. Um, <laughs> wasn't that long. But we're searching all over. We can't find it. We're seeking. We're tearing apart furniture. We're looking. Can't find this thing. She's upstairs. I'm downstairs. We have a loft. And then I hear, I see it. She's upstairs. She sees it. This is what I do. <laughs> True story. <laughs> Be brave, honey. <laughs> Kill it. <laughs> I'm downstairs. She's like, I'm scared. No lie. This is exactly what I said. Because I, re I remember we talked a few weeks ago. I, I wrote a book of Charge the Storms, right? I go, honey, charge the storm. Just like my book tells you. Face your fear. The only reason is because last time we had a bat, it was upstairs, I was downstairs, we're searching, and she hit it with a racket, and it flew over our loft and whacked me in the head and then fell down. So <laughs> I'm already scarred. <laughs> so we're seeking all over for this thing. She has it now kind of cornered, and I don't want to go up there and scare it, right? So I'm like. I manned, I manned up, I manned up. So I threw her down. I'm like, take her. So finally she mustered enough strength, I guess, because I'm about to come up there. I had to put on my shoes and my Batman clothes. Um, and she's like, I trapped it. She put the racket over it. She's like, you better get up here and kill it. I'm like, all right. So I man up. I grab a 15-pound kettleball. That's the part I'll push pause now so we don't keep going. Let me just say, <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to get into it, but I'm just, let's just say the entire, I broke, I broke picture frames, holes in our wall. It wasn't like one swing. It was like 15. I was screaming the whole time, and I'm not, I won't go into detail, but I put it on a stake out front just to warn the others, like, don't come into my house or this will happen to you. Kathy's like, I can't believe you killed a cute little bat. Look at her in the back. She's now she's like, I wish we didn't hire him. He's a bat killer. <laughs> Just so you know, Kathy, it's like the six. We finally fixed the problem so they don't get in. I've massacred many bats in my day. <laughs> I don't mind bats. They have nothing to do with everybody. I just, I just don't want them in my house. Same with my anything. I don't want, I'd rather have a bear in my house. I'm like, all right, let's square up and do this. But <laughs> while we're seeking this bat out, Nothing else mattered. That's true. Everything got put on hold. Everything. Because we didn't want to go to bed with a bat in our house. Some of you might. You guys are from Fulton. I don't know. You guys are country people. You might be like, oh, who cares? I'll sleep. I'll sleep with a bat on my arm. But <laughs> we did everything we could to find this bat. It became our 110% focus. Nothing else. That is what this word seek means. That's what God is talking about when he says, seek Jesus every day. Seek him like there's a bat in your house and you need to find it no matter what. That's, that's not our Sunday church. That is every single morning, every single day, God's saying, pursue me with everything you have. Don't focus on anything else. Give me 100% of your attention and pursue me to get to know me. That's how Jesus wants us to seek him every single day, like he's a bat in the house. The problem is we allow distractions to get in the way of that. So, before I tell us kind of the key to overcoming those distractions, I want to explain why we seek God, right? Because we're supposed to seek him every single day, so why do we seek after God? If you open up to Genesis 126, I'm going to explain why we search for God. Another way to say this is the soul searches the same way that trees grow towards the sun, if you will. Right? Trees grow up. Um, 
because there's this force that pulls them up. That's how our souls are when it comes to seeking God. There's something internal in us that, that seeks out Jesus. So if you look at Genesis 1.26, you see, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. So God created man in his image. I want you guys to circle the word image. We are the only creature in the world, including bats, that is made in God's image. That's what sets us apart from everything else in this world. We are made in the image of God. So when you're miserable in life, when you're joyless, when you're angry, when you're worried, when you're hurt, when you're broken, when you're scared, when you're fearful, those are all distractions. They pull our attention off of God. You can trace that back to not seeking God like your life depends on it. Not seeking God enough produces worry, anger, hurt, brokenness. So if you have any of that stuff in your life, that is an area where you allow distractions to get in the way from seeking after God. And he created us to seek after him. That's why I had you circle the word seek. It's actually the word tezlem, and it's the root word tezel, which means shadow. So God created us to be his shadow. That's actually what the word means, shadow, image, shadow. A shadow doesn't act independent from its creator, does it? A shadow doesn't um, wander off from its creator. A shadow magnifies whatever it's creating it. That is why we seek after God, because we are made in his shadow, and we are supposed to be his shadow here on earth. So one of my questions I want you to ponder as we talk about distractions, do people see God's image, his shadow, when they see you? Or do you allow distractions to get in the way of that? Martha was focused on what? Making dinner. She became what she desired, was um, worried and troubled because she was worried about the outcome. She wasn't focusing on the creator and she wasn't being the shadow of who God created her to be because she wasn't seeking Jesus in the presence. And what did that do? Led to worried and being troubled. So in our lives, when we kind of veer off the path of seeking Jesus with everything we have, we don't magnify his shadow the way that we're supposed to. We let worry and those things get in our way as our distractions. So I'm going to give you another image, if you will, on how to seek God more so you can get rid of distractions. I want you to visualize, and I'll show you how this ties together, a shark. We are, should be, if you will, and I'll explain why, like a shark when it comes to pursuing after Jesus every single day. I'm not talking about just our life pursuing. I'm talking about every morning when we're spending time with Jesus, we should pursue him like a shark. A shark is relentless when they seek something out. When they seek out their prey, they're relentless, and they will follow it for days and weeks at a time. I have an image of a shark, so I want you to actually visualize this next time you're spending time with Jesus. I know it's kind of hard to be like, oh, you want me to be an aggressive great white shark? Get the metaphor of it. <laughs> Sharks, if they stop moving, does anybody know what happens? They die. They sink to the bottom, they suffocate and die. If a shark stops moving forward, it suffocates and dies. This is why we need to be like a shark in our pursuit of Jesus. When we stop moving, when we let a distraction get in the way of seeking Jesus, our desire for him suffocates and dies. That's why we need to be like a shark. When you are not actively every day pursuing Jesus, like he's a bat in your house with 100% of your attention, your desire to pursue him will die. I'm not saying Jesus goes anywhere. I'm saying your desire will start to die. We desire what we focus on. So whatever you're focusing on, your distraction, distraction, what is a distraction? 
anything that keeps your mind fully off of something else. So we all have distractions. Whatever you're focusing on with your distraction stops you from pursuing Jesus, and that slowly suffocates and dies, that urge, that feeling, that need to want to be with him. So another way to say that is when you stop coming to church regularly, when you stop reading your Bible regularly, when you stop praying regularly, that desire to pursue him starts to suffocate out of you and dies. That's why we need to be like a shark and keep moving forward one step at a time, pursuing Jesus more and more each day so that desire will increase. Desire, another point to make, if you will, desire increases with movement. So the more you move towards something, the more your desire will grow. So the more you move towards pursuing Jesus, the more your desire for him will grow. I just talked to two people recently, a week or two ago, who used to be big in the church, who used to serve all the time, who used to go every week, maybe twice a week, who actually taught classes, and their whole life was engulfed in church. And then they slowly stopped going. They slowly stopped pursuing the things of Jesus. They slowly stopped talking about God with each other, with people. They, and this is after like a two, three year span. They slowly stopped serving. They slowly and gradually stopped getting involved. They slowly stopped reading their Bible in the morning. They slowly stopped doing things, moving forward. They slowly stopped, if you will, moving forward like a shark, pursuing Jesus. And now it's been maybe two years and neither of these two different people have been to church in two years, don't watch it on TV, don't talk about the things of God. They still believe in Jesus. They, you know, if you ask them, like, oh, yeah, no, we're Christians. We believe in Jesus. Their life's not showing fruit of it. They're not pursuing Jesus. Why? Because when you slowly stop pursuing him and the things of him, when you slowly stop talking about him, when you slowly stop um, Reading your Bible, your desire for him slowly starts to suffocate and die, little steps by little steps. And that's why Jesus wants us all over here, which I'll explain in a minute for other people, become this person and not let these things slow us down and start distracting us from pursuing Jesus with 100% of our focus because that is what will kill our drive for him. Does that make sense to you? The more that you're not pursuing and you're getting stuck in your distractions, whatever it is, their distractions were this. I remember them exactly where, um, oh, Sunday's our only day off. Or we like to sleep in. Or it's too hard to get the kids ready. Those are all distractions that slowly stop you from pursuing God. And what did I say in the beginning? You all have a purpose that God created you for. People need you. And I'm going to explain that in a minute. But people, Christians, this world needs you. And God wants you over here so he can use you for his kingdom, for his people. But so many of us allow distractions to get in the way, and we kind of just casually think about Jesus. We casually think of the things of God, right? We kind of just wake up in the morning and be like, all right, Jesus, bless me and my family. I'm out to work. But we don't seek him. What did Jesus say? Seek with a purpose and only focus on him. That's what desire, desire to obtain. That's what seeking means. So many of us don't get up every single morning and, and, and pursue Jesus like that with a desire to obtain something. So if you want to live your life with purpose every single day, you need to start seeking Jesus. Seeking is the number one key that will help us overcome our distractions. Like I said, it will retrain your mind. When you retrain your mind, you retrain and program how you think. And the more you focus on Jesus, the more you pursue about Jesus, the less you'll, you'll be worried about your distractions, the less you'll pursue these things and you start pursuing Jesus more, and then you'll crave him more, and then your life will start glorifying him, and you'll be his shadow on earth, and people will see Jesus in everything you do, and they'll look at you and be like, how come they're so different? How come that community is different? How come they stand out? It's because we pursue Jesus with a desire to obtain something. And when I say obtain something, now this is even my notes. Like I said, I could tell I was going to preach today. When I say obtain something, I'm not saying obtain blessings and favors and this and that. I'm saying, Jesus is saying, your desire should be to obtain me. 
Wake up and obtain me. One of these habits I just started in my life, maybe will help you, maybe it won't. I just started it because the Lord convicted me on this because I started seeking um, outcomes and goals and ambitions way more than I was seeking Jesus. Just my own personal. Um, every year on my birthday, I set goals. My birthday was two weeks ago. Excuse me, I'm waiting for my presents. Um, <laughs> And every year I set 10 goals, and they're ambitious, and they're mountains to climb, and they're boom, 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 boom. And this year the Lord dealt with me, and he's like, your one goal is to seek me more every single day. That's it. And then seek people. Two goals. None of them were ambitious. None of them were accomplished. None of them was just seek me every single day. That's your ambition. Direct your ambition to seek me with everything you have, like a bat flying in my house. Focus 100% on him. So what I do every morning now, I wake up. I don't look at my cell phone, I put it on the table, I get a cup of coffee, I go out to my awesome birthday swing that my wife got me, <laughs> and I sit there for a half an hour at least, I'm not saying you have to do it for half an hour, and see God. I don't pray, I don't say, God, uh, be with my family, uh, God, bless. that's not this time, I do that at a different time, I just seek him, I just say, Lord, show me yourself, Lord, thank you for breath today, oh, Jesus, thank you for dying for me so I can have everlasting life. Thank you for salvation. And I just sit there in silence and let him speak to me half an hour every morning, not asking, not, not looking for things, not planning my day, just, Lord, direct me. Show me what you want me to do today. Become all of my focus. Become all of my desire. I wasn't planning on sharing that, but maybe that will help somebody. That's what I've been doing. That's what I implemented in my life personally just two weeks ago. I'll let you know how it goes. Hopefully, I'm still doing it in three weeks. <laughs> so part two, did it help you, Nate, Nate, or do you do the same? Okay. All right, there we go. So Lisa, if it helped you, that's all that matters. Yes. Yep. So part two of Isaiah 58, and then we'll start to wrap up, is delight to know my ways. So, to overcome distractions, one, we seek God. We pursue him with everything we have, right? We, we focus only on him, and, and we seek after him. And the, the second part of this verse is, delight to know my ways. What are the ways of God? To overcome distractions, we need to train our mind if we want to change our mind, like I said. And one way to do that is delighting in his ways. And God's ways are people. You can say many things are his ways, but let's break it down to, to the purest form is he desires people, or he would have never sent Jesus to die for us to have everlasting life. He desires relationships with people. So delighting in God's ways is delighting in people. So if you want to overcome distractions, you need to seek God with everything you have, and you need to seek people. Another way to overcome distractions is seeking people. I believe with all my heart, every single person in here, no matter your age, this generation needs you. People need you. I want you to get that in your spirit. This generation, people need you. And I'm not saying needs you, needs you, but needs the person that God wants you to be over here that only comes from seeking him with everything you have. People need that person. Someone in here needs you over here. I think a lot of us, we underplay this feeling of being needed, right? A lot of us just kind of go through life and, and we kind of focus on ourselves and, and try to get ahead. And God's created us to work with each other. So I believe God sent me here today to say this generation needs you and every single person in here needs to be here. You need to get over your distractions because other people in here need you. The Christian walk needs you over here so you can help and witness to people over there. Another way he showed it to me, if we'll look at Genesis again, 126, where it said, um, we are made in his image. What? We're made in his tezlem, his tezel, shadow. So people are also made in God's image. We seek God because we are his shadow. So we have this urge inside us to seek him, but we should also have this urge inside us to seek out other people and to love other people because they are made in the image of God as well. 
So another way to say this is I could call people up, but Nate back there and Lori right there are both, look at them for a minute, are both made in the image of God. So if you want to get to know God more, seek out people. When you seek out people, you'll get to know God's character more. Not saying they are God's character, but we are made in his image, which means we reflect who God is. So each and every one of us has God inside us. So if we want to overcome distractions, we need to seek people. And when we seek people, we'll start to get closer to God. Because when we get closer to God's people, we get closer to God. So if I want to understand God more, I need to understand people more. And that means people I disagree with, people I don't love, people I don't like, and people I love and like. We are all created in his image, so if you want to overcome distractions that are getting in our way of pursuing who God wants us to be, we need to get over ourselves a little bit and start pursuing people because we are made in his shadow. Doug, you are made in the shadow of the creator of the universe. So when I talk to you, I'm not saying your character and your faults and your everything else, be for real, because we all have those, but there's something inside you that God put in there. God lives in you. So the more I get to know you, the more I get to know God, because God loves you more than anything in this world. He loves every one of us more than anything. That's why he sent Jesus for us, to die for us, because he loves us so much, he became flesh and died for us because he loves us that much. And he's saying, just seek me. Seek me with everything you have. Pursue me because this world needs you. People need you. And then pursue each other. If you want to overcome distractions and live your life with purpose, pursue each other because you'll find God in every single one of them. And, and, and you'll see my character. And you'll see my shadow. And then I'll start pulling out positives out of Nate. And he'll start pulling positives out of me. And he'll also start sharpening me on my negatives. And I'll start sharpening him on our negatives. And Doug, you'll be pulling out, and I'll be pulling in, and we'll be connecting, and that will show the world Jesus. And then we can talk more about Jesus. We can share the love of Jesus because we are all connected with each other, building each other up, showing the world Jesus. So to overcome distractions, you need to pursue Jesus and pursue people with everything you have in you. I remember one time in my life, this is kind of my idea of why God wants us over here. I was in church for years. I won't get into the story because I'm about to wind up. But like I said, I knew I, was, I didn't think I was going to preach today. Um, it's so hot in here. I try not to. Um, but I was desperate. There's this one point in my life, in my Christian walk, where I was defeated. I was desperate. It felt like the world was against me. Circumstances wouldn't change. Anybody ever felt that way before? Am I the only one? Only one? Okay. Um, <laughs> No matter what I did, nothing was changing, right? I was seeking God. Nothing was changing. Life circumstances were not moving. And I remember arguing with God in my head over and over again and having this impossible situation. But, but God, but eventually... I've been doing this Christian ministry pastoring for 10 years now, and every single time this comes true. But God eventually sent someone to me that took care of this need at this time. It was actually a financial need. I won't get into it. But, but God sent someone to me that I wasn't expecting with an unbelievable circumstance with thousands of thousands upon thousands of dollars that I owed that just I couldn't get out of. And someone came to me without me asking. I was just seeking God and said, I want to help. The Lord told me that I need to help you. I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, I have to help you with it. So I remember meeting with this person, and I won't get into details, but saying, um, this has been on my heart. This, I can't get out of this. This is just driving me nuts. It's driving me crazy. And he said, I want to take care of all that for you. So my point is this. That person had to be where God wanted him to be. God uses people. God uses people. God uses people. God uses people to carry out his will. 
to carry out what he wants. God uses people. That's why connections. That's why I preach connections every time I'm in here with relationship. God uses us, each other, to take care of each other. So this person had to be in life. We're all over here at one point, wherever we're at in our walk. Distractions getting in our way. That person I'm talking about had to be over here where God wanted him to be, or he wouldn't have been able to sowed and helped into my life, which I needed. Does that make sense to you? God wants us all over here so we can go benefit and help other people, whatever that looks like. It doesn't have to be financial, but whatever that looks like. He has us here, and he wants us over here. This person had to be over here to be able to help me over there. We all need to be over here. People need us. I cannot get to where I need to get to 100% in my ministry, in my life, without some of you getting to where you need to get to in your ministry, in your life. Let me say it one more time. Because it, it fits all of us. I, and you, and Lori, and I, listen to every, You can't get to 100% where God wants you to get to to some of you, us, start getting to where God wants us to get to because we're all connected. We're all in relationships. Lori has something in her that I need, and I have something in me that she needs, but I need her to get over her distractions. Same with me. I'm not picking on Lori, but we all have distractions to get to where God wants us to get to so we can build off each other and show the world Jesus. We all have something in us that this world needs. You have value. God does not have breath in your lungs if you do not have purpose and value. You have purpose and value and a mission, and God wants you over here. And the only way to overcome those distractions and get over here so you can live each day with purpose is relentlessly seeking after Jesus every single day and relentlessly pursuing people. If we could all get over here, whew, this world would be a better place. Things in this community would be a lot better. Our lives would reflect Jesus a lot more. And the fun thing about life, as long as we have breath in our lungs, as soon as we get over here, God now wants us over there, and there's another chair in the way. We don't stop. It's a growing progression that we have to keep getting to until the day we die. But I'm here today to encourage us all to go from there to here and overcome your distractions. So we'll end with a challenge. I have a challenge for you guys. And it's this. I want you to pick up one distraction. We're going to retrain our brain to eliminate distractions. Pick one distraction this week. It can be social media. It can be YouTube. It can be TV. It can be sleeping in. It can be um, focusing on past pain. Whatever it is. Pick one, just one distraction. And for one week, you're going to eliminate it. One week, no social media or one week, no YouTube, or one week, no TV, or one week, no sleeping in, or one week, no whatever your distraction is, making dinner while you're supposed to be hanging out with Jesus. Whatever your distraction is, one week of none of that. And when I used to teach addictions, I would tell people, it usually takes 30 days, we're only doing a week, because I'll forget in two weeks. Um, one week of that, but you need to replace it with a behavior. So whenever you have that urge to get on social media, or whenever you have that urge to watch TV, or whenever you have that urge to... Engage in your distraction. Replace that with seeking Jesus or building someone up. So you got to get on Facebook. Instead, text someone or email someone and build them up or seek Jesus. You're going to reprogram your brain. Every time a distraction comes in, you reprogram it to chasing and pursuing Jesus or building someone up. This is my prayer every single morning, and then we will pray and end this. As I ask God... Who do you want me to add value to today, and who can I serve today? If you guys just did that before church, I promise you God would highlight somebody to you. He does every single time. I sit there with my eyes and say, God, who can I add value to today? And a face pops up every single time. That is my prayer every single day. These things, if you guys will bow your heads with me, will pray, will help you overcome distractions so you can pursue Jesus, and we can become what this world needs us to become so we can show the world the Savior of the universe through our relationships, through our words, through our actions, through whoever God wants us to become over here because we need each other. Father, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for every single person in here. I thank you for love. I thank you for forgiveness. And most of all, I thank you for your son, Jesus, who went to the cross and got nailed to a cross and died for us. And then three days later, rose again so we could have forgiveness of our sins and everlasting life through our pursuit of him. 
Father, it's not about works. It's not about our actions. But it's about faith and belief in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Father. So I ask that every single person in here pursues Jesus a little bit more. A little bit more every single day. And I ask that you bless every single one of us. You watch over us. And Father, I just thank you for every single person in here. Let every word that was from you take root. And any word that was from me fall to the ground. And thank you even for horrible, scary bats. In Jesus' name, amen. There is cookies and goodies in the basement. And please, and please unfasten your seatbelts and head out. Didn't I sound like an airplane guy there for a minute? Yeah.